Hello class, uh, welcome back to week one of the online lecture. Now what I want to do is just discuss um, these uh, meds that you were to um, look up and review. The reason these meds were chosen is because they represent the meds that you might get for your uh, injection skill uh, checkoff. Okay, and Glargen um, even though we're not really talking uh, precisely about diabetes in week one, uh, Glargen is a type of insulin that would be given uh, subcutaneous route. So that's why that was chosen. Along with um, heparin subcutaneous, uh, the Mantooth TB test uh, would be given intradermally. Morphine sulfate is another medication. Uh, that we might see given IM, but it's mostly given IV route, but I will talk a little bit about that. And of course the flu and pneumonia vaccines are given intramuscularly. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, amantadine, which is an antiviral medication. Um, pretty, pretty um, appropriate to talk about that now as we're going through this uh, pandemic. And then uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about penicillin G, which might be another medication that you would give uh, a patient intramuscularly. So those are the uh, examples of some of the medications that you might uh, choose uh, to administer to your patient uh, when you're doing your first skills checkoff of injections. All right, so let's first take a look at Glargen. Um, and I want you to know, too, that as we continue talking about the various insulins, which we're not going to do right now, we're going to leave that for week four, since that will correlate with your diabetes lecture, uh, we're going to go by the chart that's in your Adams book, your pharmacology book, which is um, on page 716. So um, that also talks about Glargen as well. Uh, you might know Glargen as the name uh, of Lantus. It's a long-acting insulin. It does not have a peak, but it does provide for a steady maintenance of uh, uh, blood sugars. It also may improve uh, someone's uh, hemoglobin A1c, and with your type 2 diabetics that may have to be put on um, glargen, uh, it may improve their lipids, meaning that their um, HDLs, those good cholesterols, may start to increase as they see the LDLs start to decrease. All right, you might ask yourself, why uh, would someone be put on Glargen? And that's a very good question. Uh, we know that it's a long-acting insulin, but sometimes these diabetic patients really have a hard time controlling their insulin, even when we really pay attention to uh, their blood sugars uh, throughout the day when they're testing. Uh, hopefully at least four times a day. So to be able to control that blood sugar just a little bit better um, because it uh, has a gradual um, effect on blood sugar and it doesn't it has no peak but it may start to work up to 24 hours where it just provides enough insulin to uh, keep those blood sugars in a, a good healthy range. Uh, that's why someone may be uh, additionally put on um, Glargen, okay? It's uh, a, a, an insulin that should be given the same time each day, usually once a day. Uh, we might give it in the morning, might give it at night, just depending on how the patient does with their blood glucoses. Um, should be uh, given, like as I said, uh, the same time each day in no regard to meals. Um, you cannot mix it with other insulins, which is an important, um, um, what should I say, a characteristic of Glargen, um, only given sub-Q. Um, and with any diabetic, which we'll talk a lot about more uh, in week four, but knowing a little bit about your patient's history with their diabetes, um, understanding how their blood pressures run, their vital signs, and making sure that all diabetics are uh, checking their blood glucose four times a day. 
And then, of course, since it's given sub Q only, uh, it may be given in addition to the prandial types of insulin um, at meal times. Uh, these patients are injecting themselves a lot on a daily basis, uh, obviously depending on their blood sugars, but really assessing their injection sites. Um, and if this still is um, not really controlling their blood sugars quite well, we might want to assess their diet and uh, definitely look at other variables which affect blood glucose as well. Um, always, uh, you know, kind of assess the patient if we're seeing some very, very high blood sugars. Uh, we might also want to assess urine for spilling ketones and glucose in the urine because these patients could be at risk for a possible diabetic emergency known as diabetic ketoacidosis. So that's Glargen. Um, it does, um, it is included on that chart on page 17, uh, 716 in your Adams book as well. It is a drug or an insulin that again can only be given subcutaneously, okay? And according to that chart on page 716 in your Adams book, um, again, it is a long um, acting insulin. Onset may happen about 1 to 2.1.5 hours. There is no peak and duration is uh, up to 24 hours, okay? Again, subcutaneous once daily and it is important that it's given at the same time each day and do not mix with any other insulin. So that's your glargin, okay? All right, now we're gonna talk about heparin. Heparin, um, we see heparin given for various reasons. Uh, one reason um, which is associated with the subcutaneous route is the fact that we may give it to a patient prophylactically particularly if they have um, decreased uh, mobility, um, so they have a decreased risk of obtaining some kind of clot or some problem with coagulation. Uh, the prototype for heparin is on page 436, okay? I really wanna talk about heparin. You have had heparin already in Nursing 123, but I find that students really don't understand heparin like they should. Um, we give it uh, with every one of our pharmacology courses because, is, because it is a very uh, important drug that we see uh, prescribed quite a lot for our patients who are at risk for clots um, or who have some kind of um, uh, problems, say, for instance, with um, acute coronary syndrome. Patients might be on this because of a pulmonary emboli. Therapeutically, we see it as an anticoagulant, but it is pharmacologically classified as an, an indirect thrombin inhibitor, okay? And maybe some of this is a refresher uh, type of information for you. Uh, remember, heparin is a natural substance that's found in the liver and in the lining of our blood vessels. Its normal function is to prolong coagulation time, thereby preventing excess, excessive clotting within the blood vessels. And so here's exactly how heparin works, okay? And I think this is something I want to make sure that I get this point across because this is very important to important to know because if I ask this question on a test to tell me what is the action of heparin, I get all kinds of different answers. But really, as the book states, heparin prevents the enlargement of existing clots and it prevents the formation of new ones. So that's why we give heparin. Remember, it does not have the ability to dissolve existing clots. And people are under the impression that it does. So if someone gets diagnosed with a pulmonary emboli, it doesn't mean that if we give heparin, maybe um, through an IV route, that it's going to dissolve that clot. That is not how heparin works. It works by preventing the enlargement of an existing clot 
and it prevents the formation of new ones. So that's something I wanted to make sure that you understood very, very clearly because I wanted you to understand exactly what the action of heparin is, especially when we're giving it for a much more serious problem and not for um, a reason such as prophylactically to prevent the person from getting cl uh, clots. Uh, it's a high alert med, of course. Um, many times when we're follow following heparin protocol, if we have to give a bolus or an injection of, a, of, of heparin, uh, we would definitely um, check that dosage with another RN. Um, it's used to treat DVTs, uh, pulmonary emboli, MI, uh, unstable angina, and it's to prevent thrombosis in high-risk patients. Um, the good thing is if uh, you have a pregnant woman who develops some kind of uh, thrombolytic event, um, this would be preferred during pregnancy due to the fact that heparin ha are large molecules and they're um, too large to cross the placenta. Um, it activates the enzyme antithrombin 3, which in turn inhibits thrombin, and it inactivates factor 5, which is one factor needed for the cascading um, clotting mechanism. And high doses of heparin uh, will interfere with platelet aggregation. Now, even when we're going to give uh, prophylactic heparin, uh, there is some risk of prolonged bleeding or bleeding tendencies, and that's why it's important that we as nurses assess uh, their um, coagulation profiles, okay, and look at such things as um, PTTs, INRs, uh, PTs, uh, and platelet counts. Uh, it's important to continue to assess that platelet, platelet count, especially if they're on higher doses, uh, but it can still affect um, uh, platelets uh, even when on low dose for prophylactic reasons. Um, usually we'll hold uh, platelets uh, if they're below 100,000 and we would definitely notify the healthcare provider if we did see some abnormal bleeding. And areas that we look at for bleeding are urine, uh, blood in the urine, any kinds of um, GI bleeding, looking for any kind of tarry stools, and even looking at some of the mucous membranes to see if there's uh, tendencies for bleeding there, and also to assess the skin integrity, looking for any types of bruising, petechiae, things like that, that may show uh, evidence of some capillary fragility. Uh, epidural spinal hematomas may occur if these are being done or removed. And so if uh, you know of your patient on heparin, even subcutaneously, we would hold it at least six hours prior and a couple hours after. Uh, the one big complication that we see uh, with uh, Heparin is HIT, which stands for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and that may appear five to ten days after beginning theria, uh, therapy. It may also cause osteoporosis in prolonged use, may cause skin lesions, and do not use if we note of in any internal bleeding or uh, someone that may have a history of severe hypertension, uh, any recent trauma, any intracranial hemorrhage, or any bacterial endocarditis. Um, use cautiously in renal and hepatic patients that um, we can see um, may raise labs to toxic levels. And again, assessing patients and um, their intake of any type of herbs uh, because you should not take it with ginger, garlic, or green tea, uh, fever, few, uh, ginkgo has increased risk of bleeding. Um, and we need to be careful about taking it with nicotine, digoxin, tetracyclines, and antihistamines as they may inhibit anticoagulation. Now, if we see that the patient has um, is really starting to bleed, uh, if overdose occurs, um, the antidote for that is, is protamine sulfate. And it's important to really know how to um, administer that in case of an emergency where the patient is bleeding or hemorrhaging. 
So as nurses, we would definitely assess bruising, assess uh, falling risk because if they fall, uh, they could hit their heads and cause a intracranial bleed and monitor labs such as PTT, especially if they're on IV heparin. But normally if they're on the subcutaneous heparin, we would just watch for any evidence of bleeding and we would not do um, PTTs on them for prophylactic heparin. Um, obviously keep an eye on their H&H, &H, platelets, uh -huh. assess for signs of bleeding, checking urine, feces, um, and definitely if they have um, an NGN to um, assess the color of that drainage. Um, and again, assess injection site for bruising, redness, swelling, and signs of infection. And I would really recommend too that um, you look at the uh, administration of heparin subcutaneously, which is found in your um, clinical nursing skills book um, by um, Barbara Callahan, the third edition. Um, obviously assess vital signs, which can uh, be the first sign of bleeding, okay? Um, this drug is also called an unfractionated heparin uh, to uh, distinguish it from those low molecular weight heparins, okay? Heparin has both a prophylactic and, uh, and treatment indications. Uh, we use it at low doses to prevent uh, thromboembolic uh, events arising from open heart and vascular surgery and dialysis procedures or in patients with unstable angina or in the acute stages of MI. We might see it then ordered at higher doses to treat conditions, which I've already mentioned, in which immediate anticoagulation is necessary, such as someone um, being confirmed a DVT and pulmonary embolism. All right. Um, when we give it IV, you know, as a continuous drip, uh, there is a weight-based um, nomogram, which um, is used. And this um, is definitely administered based on a patient's weight and based, based on their PTT values and their clinical indications for this drug, okay? I'm not going to get into detail with, about that because you'll get more of that in detail in Farm 3 when you do learn to um, calculate how much heparin um, is given um, to keep the patient at a therapeutic range, okay? Uh, when you do administer heparin subcutaneous, which you will be doing, uh, you would never draw back the syringe plunger once the needle has entered the site and never massage the site after injection. Doing either of those um, types of things can contribute to bleeding or tissue damage. And uh, you would never give uh, heparin intramuscularly. It is contraindicated due to the bleeding risk. And as I said, pregnant women can receive this if uh, need be. Um, I already talked about the epidural spinal hematomas that may occur. Um, obviously, we would never give heparin uh, to patients with active internal bleeding, bleeding disorders, severe hypertension, recent trauma, intracranial hemorrhage, or bacterial endocarditis, as I mentioned before. Um, interactions. Other anticoagulants, such as warfarin, potentiate the action of heparin and can lead to serious bleeding. Drugs that inhibit platelet aggregation, such as aspirin, um, and some Motrin may induce bleeding. Um, and of course, uh, assessing uh, their APTT uh, if they're on IV heparin. Um, other than that, uh, I think I pretty much covered everything with heparin, heparin. But the important thing that I wanted to definitely make sure that you understood was exactly how heparin works and what it actually does when a person is uh, diagnosed with some kind of uh, serious clot. Okay? So uh, that's heparin. And as I said, the prototype uh, is on page 436 in your Adams book as well, okay? All right, let's talk a little bit about the uh, Mantooth TB test. This might be a um, drug that you choose to um, present and demonstrate your uh, intradermal injection uh, because our Mantooth TB tests are um, 
administered intradermally. Um, therapeutically, it's a purified protein derivative, a PPD, and um, it's used for diagnosing TB or exposure to TB. All right. Um, if by some chance um, uh, the uh, injection uh, is administered and um, you wait 48 to 72 hours to look at the skin and see if there's any induration. Um, if it is positive, uh, positive doesn't mean that you have TB. It just means you've been exposed to it. And um, you would probably have further testing, uh, which would consist of a, a chest x-ray and some, a sputum test and further lab work. Um, along with the positive reaction to the medication, the skin will be extremely reddened. Um, so that's basically what your man tooth uh, tuberculin skin test is all about, okay? Um, and I know you're all very familiar with that because we ourselves as nurses and as student nurses have had this test to be um, determined if there is any exposure to the bacterium um, tuberculosis, okay? Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, morphine sulfate. All right, let's talk about morphine sulfate. Um, therapeutically, it's a narcotic analgesic, and pharmacologically, it's an opiate agonist, okay? Um, it's used to treat uh, acute and severe pain, and um, it relieves chest pain and NMI. Um, and this is what the um, first drug of choice is when someone is experiencing uh, some time of subtype of uh, pain associated with uh, myocardial infarction. Uh, might also be given for pre-anesthetic sedation. Uh, might be used to calm agitated patients. Uh, we see this um, given uh, for terminally ill patients, um, especially end of life with um, the diagnosis of, of cancer. Um, sometimes we see it with anxiety. Um, and some respiratory distress, which um, the etiology of that is to rule out heart failure. Uh, we might see it with pulmonary edema and, uh, of course, end-stage cancer. Um, also uh, might be administered epidurally through an injection for post-surgical pain. Um, morphine... Um, can cause sometimes euphoria, uh, constriction of the pupils, and uh, stimulation of cardiac muscle. It is used for um, symptomatic relief of serious and acute chronic pain uh, after non-narcotic analgesics have failed. Uh, and um, we can see it given um, orally, and the oral solution can also be given sublingually. And... Um, if it is going to be given orally, uh, it comes available in multiple strengths. So make sure that we're observing, um, you know, and uh, assessing the labels to make sure that we're giving the correct ordered dose. Um, how morphine works too, along with um, helping to relieve acute and chronic pain is it also um, causes peripheral vasodilatation which this is why it's very important to assess someone's blood pressure because it can cause orthostatic uh, hypotension. Um, patients should never open capsules or crush extended release forms of opiates unless directed to do so by the healthcare provider. Um, obviously with uh, morphine as far as adverse effects um, it does have some um, effect definitely on the central nervous system um, be sure that we are not letting patients up and walking around as we may see the patients exhibit some dizziness um, confusion feeling of floating hallucinations and sometimes sometimes seizures uh, the one thing that we worry about is um, the, the respiratory effort. Um, 
many times we might see uh, respiratory depression because of the amount of morphine that was administered to the patient and with that can cause um, increased CO2 retention uh, which may affect um, cerebral vasodilatation, increased cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, because of um, the um, characteristic of being an opiate agonist, uh, patients may experience nausea and vomiting um, and definitely opiate constipation due to the slowing down of peristalsis. Um, like I said before, peripheral dilatation can cause hypotension. Sometimes we see some skin irritations and itching and rashing. Rashes may occur. Um, obviously, if you're on an opiate, you should not be taking or drinking any kinds of alcohol or taking any skeletal muscle relaxants or any... Um, monoamine uh, oxidase inhibitors. Um, use very cautiously in the elderly and anybody who has undiagnosed abdominal pain, hepatic or renal impairments, or any type of um, changes in their central nervous system as far as depression or any type of um, head injuries or increased intracranial increased incre increased cranial pressure, or even patients with respiratory problems such as COPD or even severe obesity due to respiratory distress. Um, do not stop abruptly. Um, nursing infants can withdraw too. Uh, wait about four to six hours before breastfeeding um, and avoid uh, 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 cava, uh, valerian, uh, chamomile, and St. John's wort if um, you're on uh, morphine sulfate. Okay. Uh, because if it's an opiate, remember there always is the chance, especially if people are on this long term, that there could be some physical and psychological dependence uh, de develops when people are on these high doses for long periods of time. Again, uh, the black box warning is when morphine is administered as an epidural drug, Due to the risk of adverse uh, effects, patients must be observed in a fully equipped and staffed environment for at least 24 hours. <laughs> Obviously, morphine is contraindicated um, or may intensify or mask the pain of gallbladder disease due to biliary tract spasms. Um, and morphine should also be avoided in cases of acute or severe asthma. Um, along with GI obstruction and severe liver or kidney impairment. Obviously, that's how the drug is excreted from the body and through the liver. That is how the drug is metabolized. <clears throat> uh, treatment of overdose, obviously, because of it being a opiate, uh, naloxone is the specific treatment. Uh, other treatments may include activated charcoal, a laxative and a counteracting narcotic antagonist. And um, we might have to give multiple doses of that to combat the, re the effects of morphine. Um, it's a great drug, but it also does take a lot of responsibility that goes with administering morphine. Um, and if uh, a patient is getting it for the first time and maybe the order is written for a range patient may have, uh, two to four milligrams every six or eight hours, depending on how the order is written. I would probably start with the lower dose, especially uh, depending on the size of the patient to kind of see how the patient reacts with that medication. Because some people really do well with the lower end of the dosage rather than snow them so heavily that it could cause some of these serious side effects, dropping their blood pressure and causing them respiratory depression. All right. Um, again, those are the things that we, um, you know, see most often is uh, their consciousness as long as, and also assessing their respiratory status and looking at their blood pressure and just seeing if they're having any of these uh, adverse effects that affect the central nervous system, such as confusion, seizures, um, or agitation. Um, if you know of the patient who uh, tends to be very sensitive to some of these opiates, it might be important and effective to give nausea meds about 30 to 60 minutes prior to taking the opiates. All right.
it. So that's morphine. And as I said, that's in your Adams book on page 230 um, as a prototype there. Okay. All right. The next uh, set of medications that we're going to look at are the um, flu and pneumonia vaccines. And uh, not a whole lot to say about um, these medications, but obviously they're given uh, intramuscularly. They're vaccines. Um, and, of course, with the flu vaccine, it helps protect uh, the body against flu. All right. Um, and we know flu is a uh, viral infection. And some of the symptoms that we see with patients who tend to get flu are sore throat, sneezing, coughing, and fever and chills. Um, flu is transmitted via airborne droplets and also hand-to-hand -hand contact. Um, most people survive the flu, but some of our patients who are more vulnerable or immunocompromised, uh, the flu may be fatal for that person. Um, we see different strains of flu, A, B, and C, and type A is the most common, causes the most severe symptoms. Um, and with each flu type comes a new subtype. Uh, type B is less common. You have milder symptoms, but no major subtypes. And type C is less common, um, more um, manifested like the common cold. Um, so that's uh, a flu vaccine. Obviously prepared with portions of the most likely type A and B flu. Um, again, it's important to assess egg and mercury allergies. Um, nasal form is live. Um, which can be administered to patients 2 to 49 years of age and uh, women who are not pregnant. Sometimes you might see redness or soreness at the injection site, and if you've had a flu vaccine, your arm is very, very sore after uh, you've received the injection. That usually continues for a few days. Um, sometimes after receiving the vaccine, you may feel a little fever, chills, muscle aches, flu-like symptoms that last about one to two days. So again, uh, assessing their medical history, assessing allergies, looking at blood pressure, make sure they don't have a fever because if they do, you would not want to administer this, and assess lab work if they're on any type of anticoagulants. And again, uh, the pneumonia vaccine helps to protect the body against pneumonia, derived from cell walls of 23 stains of S. pneumonia, usually um, suggested that these um, patients 65 or older um, uh, or anybody between the ages of 2 and 64 with chronic illnesses or increased risk, immunocompromised with something like HIV, leukemia, lymphoma, Hodgkin's or multiple myeloma, uh, transplant recipients, patients who are on high doses of corticosteroids um, would be recommended to receive this vaccine. Again, uh, the same goes for assessing medical history, assessing allergies, assessing vital signs, and making sure that the patient doesn't have a fever before giving the injection. Um, pneumonia, again, is a very serious um, uh, illness. Sometimes we see pneumonia result uh, after someone has had some type of influenza infection. It's the ninth leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, prevention is obviously uh, the annual um, or the vaccine, um, and it does benefit most of uh, the patients who are 65 or older, all right, um, and also healthcare workers as well. Um, so uh, that's a little bit about both of those vaccines, okay? All right, so um, the next drug I want to talk about is um, amantadine. Uh, amantadine is an antiviral for influenza. Uh, pharmacolo pharmacologically, it's a viral replication. Um, it reduces the duration of flu symptoms and protects against flu. Um, given for two weeks after flu vaccine to prevent flu. Um, used mainly in immunocompromised healthcare workers, people in close contact with high risk. And sometimes um, we see that given to uh, Parkinson patients uh, due to anticholinergic effects. All right. Um, 
how it works we're not completely sure uh, it's thought to inhibit viral replication by preventing uncoating it may also affect assembly of some of new viruses um, it's used for anti parkinson Sonism effects due to the release of dopamine and norepinephrine from neuronal storage sites and possibly prevent their uptake. Uh, it can have some uh, CNS effects, um, causing someone to develop insomnia, dizziness, lightheadedness, or loss of concentration or mental confusion. Uh, worsen mental problems in patients who have psychiatric uh, uh, issues. Um, if you know of a patient who has renal insufficiency or they're a chronic renal patient, um, you can build up toxicity, which they can develop um, signs of toxicity such as hallucinations, seizures, and coma, and dysrhythmias. Uh, use cautiously in those patients and also uh, in um, patients who have a history of seizures. Uh, can cause peripheral edema and heart failure, uh, should not stop abruptly, and should not take with alcohol, anticholinergics, and um, other than that, um, knowing a little bit about their medical history, uh, assess changes in behavior, and uh, assess for signs and symptoms of blood dyscrasias, 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 and encourage good hygiene to reduce the risk of infection. So that's amanidine, okay? Uh, the next one I want to talk about, the reason we have selected uh, penicillin G is because um, this may be one of the uh, drugs that you may, given, may give uh, in the intramuscular route um, for your injection um, skill checkoff, okay? This is um, also in your uh, Adam's book. Um, as a prototype on page 511, as I have listed in your weekly lesson plan. It's uh, therapeutic, therapeutically an antibacterial, and pharmacologically it's a cell wall inhibitor, a natural penicillin. Um, this is a, a, a penicillin that's uh, very similar to other penicillins. Um, usually the drug of choice with someone who's been diagnosed with um, a streptococci infection, uh, pneumonia cocci, or a staphylococci uh, infection due to those particular organisms. Um, it is also a medication of choice for people with um, STD such as gonorrhea and syphilis caused by those susceptible strains. Um, penicillin uh, G uh, or bicillin and penicillin G procaine are longer acting parental salts of the drug. Um, only about 15 to 30 percent of an oral dose of penicillin G is absorbed. Because of its low oral absorption, penicillin G is often given more of the um, IV or intramuscular route. So that's why we have chosen this drug as a um, selection of drugs for your IM uh, route for your skills checkoff. <clears throat> Anytime someone is getting an antibiotic, such as a penicillin um, derivative for the first time, it's always important to see how the patient tolerates and how the patient responds to the medication. Um, it's important if these uh, patients are on other antibiotics that um, penicillin and aminoglycosides are not um, given in the same IV uh, solution. So if they're on those medications, it's important that those IV medications are given one hour apart uh, to prevent any type of interactions. All right. Um, really, penicillin G has very few serious adverse effects. Again, the typical GI problems with nausea, vomiting, and even some GI disturbances such as diarrhea. If it's given intramuscular, there may be some pain at the injection site, and some super infections are possible to occur. Um, obviously, an anaphylactic reaction is one of the most serious effects, 
Um, but usually you'll see that within minutes, especially if you're seeing the patient get this for the first time. That's why it's important to stay with the patient in the first few minutes of administration to make sure that the patient is doing okay with that. Um, obviously, the only contraindication is to know if they've had any known hypersensitivity or allergies to the medication. Um, always be sure you're aware of your patient's renal function because um, with penicillin G excreted through the kidneys, uh, the, patient, the drug should be used with caution in patients with severe renal disease. Um, one important thing, especially when we're giving this to a young a woman, if she's on some kind of oral contraceptives, contraception, uh, or penicillin G may decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptives. <clears throat> uh, potassium sparing diuretics may cause hyperkalemia when administered with penicillin G potassium and because penicillins can antagonize the action of aminoglycosides antibiotics drugs from these two classes are not administered concurrently as I talked about earlier. Um, there's no specific treatment for any type of um, overdose. Um, one thing with lab tests, uh, penicillin G may give positive Coombs test and false positive urinary or serum protein test. So that concludes my um, review of the medications that were listed in your weekly lesson plan. Um, please review these. Um, all this information is very testable, but I really want you to understand how each of these uh, medications work because if you're giving them as uh, a medication to your patient in a particular route, you need to understand why your patient is on that medication, um, what is the action, any type of nursing interventions, and what is the uh, possible adverse effects that could occur from these drugs, and what is the kind of um, patient outcomes that I want to see when these uh, medications are administered. So uh, please, if you have any types of questions after reviewing uh, part one from the DA PowerPoints and the information I provided earlier, and then from part two, which consists of the review of your uh, medications that you're responsible for, I'd be more than happy to uh, answer any questions. Please review some of the practice questions at the end of the chapter, not only in your Adams book, but of course in your DA book. This will give you a better idea of how well you have understood the information that has been presented to you, and um, you might see those questions pop up some other time. Um, I will send out an email on Sunday to um, direct you as to uh, when the webcast will uh, occur next week so we can stay connected and have some talk time uh, for you to have the opportunity to uh, ask any questions about anything regarding Nursing 124 because I want you to do really good. This is really important information and I get all excited about these medications because um, I really like to learn about medications and and know as much as possible so that I can definitely keep my patients safe and understand why they've been ordered for our patients. So continue uh, reading and um, I wish you all the best. Please stay safe but remember I'm here for you completely and as I said earlier I will be checking my email frequently. So um, enjoy your day and take care.